introduction to social enterprise. I got really excited about that, and in 2003, um, I had the opportunity to leave my business and work directly in a nonprofit social enterprise called Rebuild Resources in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, St. Paul, technically. Uh, Rebuild worked with addicts and alcoholics that were coming out of the prison system uh, and uh, employed them in a, a couple of businesses there, the largest one being a screen printing and embroidery business that produced corporate apparel for companies and consumers all over the uh, all over the country. And a lot of my experience of social enterprise and the vast impact it could make both on human life but also on society uh, came from that direct hands-on experience of working with addicts and alcoholics uh, at social or at rebuilt resources. And in that process um, it led me to have the opportunity to write a book called Mission Incorporated, which I meant to pack a few and bring tonight, but I forgot. Um, I always do that, and if you write books, you're not supposed to forget that most important <laughs> step. But it was a practitioner's book about social enterprise that was based on really what I learned from interviewing 20 other social enterprises around the country and, and figuring out what they did on a day-to-day -day basis to make them successful. As a result of that, I went on the board of SEA, and uh, it was very kind of Nikki to introduce me as the new CEO of SEA, but I actually realized since tomorrow was about my fifth or sixth board meeting, we have them every quarter uh, since I've been with SEA, I can no longer milk the new car uh, as CEO. So what I do now at CEO, I'm actually responsible for. Uh, I joined in the summer, uh, the middle of 2011, sort of part-time at first and then full-time at Labor Day, and so I've been <coughs> full-time CEO of SEA for about 15 or 16 months. And that brings me to, to you today. Um, you might have seen this slide at the beginning of my uh, presentation, uh, or uh, as, as I came up. This is my one of my favorite pieces of art. It's by this radical graffiti artist called uh, by the name of Banksy. That's actually a stencil piece of art. But I, I actually, when I saw this piece of art at a uh, vendor in Venice Beach a few years ago, I actually thought this actually describes to me what social what social enterprise is uh, to me. Now, here, here's what I mean by that. Uh, we have witnessed, you know, in the last uh, month or so, this, uh, I'm going to call it a debacle in Washington, uh, over, over, basically over the future of our economy. And you can be on either side of that uh, partisan divide. But what, what, what they're arguing about, in my humble opinion, is the future of the economy, because I think both sides inherently understand and know that the economy as we know it isn't working, right? And so they're, they're searching for solutions, and they're having fights about them. We can raise taxes, or we can cut spending, or we can do neither, or we can do both. But it's, it's a big fight over, over the economy. And what it tells me is that something in the economy has to change. Um, and so this image, you know, the, the classic picture um, of the Bolshevik uh, is usually one that he's armed with a Molotov cocktail and is going to incite revolution and violence to try to change an economy that at that point in time they didn't think worked. And what I think that social enterprise along us, what social enterprise is about, is about fundamentally altering the economy so that it works better for everyone, but doing it not with violence and not with revolution and not with overthrow, but doing it with a bouquet, doing it with love, doing it for the common good, um, doing it with humanity, and doing it in community. And when I really boil down all the facts and figures and everything else that I've learned about social enterprise, uh, over my time in it. it. It really is, to me, about the sort of the loving overthrow of the parts of the economy that aren't working in a way that it works for everyone, uh, in a way that's beneficial, where it takes the power of the economy and the power of business and it puts it to work uh, for the common good. And, and I'll talk a little bit later about how I actually think that this is why the, the opportunity for, for social enterprise is so vast right now. It's because we are a society that is definitely in search of a solution, and I think that, that social enterprise is one. Now, I want to uh, talk about a couple of words that 
that aren't what social enterprise is, and they're actually words that, as I've learned more about social enterprise, have come to uh, to to sort of bother me in a one in, in one way or the other. One phrase is not for profit. A lot of a lot of the people that are here are not for profits, but I've actually come to have a little bit of an objection to that phrase, and the reason is is that that by definition the phrase not for profit sort of implies that. Um, Everything should be for profit, and, and or that, that profit is the status quo, um, and that uh, what differentiates a nonprofit is that a, a difference from the status quo. You know? But it sort of sets the bar at uh, profit is the status quo and the default for anything that happens uh, in the economy. Profit is extremely important, and the economy wouldn't work without it. But to say that that's the only thing, and that anything else is not that. I find kind of objectionable. <clears throat> Another one, NGO. Uh, I started to hear this word about 10 years ago uh, as another way to describe in some countries more in the developing world what nonprofits are. That stands for non-governmental organization. And like nonprofit, that sort of implies that the answer to problems is government, that government is the default for fixing things in our society. And therefore, that anything that is not government is sort of different from the default of government, if that makes any sense. And, and I've started to think, you know, that doesn't really describe how things ought to work or how I'd like to see things work. It certainly doesn't describe the point of view of social enterprise. The, the phrase that I like, and I think that the phrase that describes the broadest swath of social enterprises is for purpose. If we thought about economics from the standpoint of the purpose of economics. Um, and and we, we made that the sort of the bar against which we measure success of an enterprise. What's the purpose? What's it creating? I think that we'd have a fundamentally different world. And I think that that's what the social enterprise world is. So the four purpose economy, the economy that I think that we're all working for, whether we're organized as nonprofits or for profits or anything in between, is an economy where social enterprises exist for the purpose of creating solutions and uh, that, that go to the world and that in making the profit of doing that, it allows social enterprises to create more solutions for more of the world. That to me is really, really exciting. So when I think about social enterprise, I mean, I just, and why I love getting together in, our, in, a, in a forum like this with other social enterprises, my excitement comes from the fact that we are the, the hearkening and the burgeoning of that kind of economy, of the for-purpose economy. And when I get to talk to people and, and go out and visit social enterprises, it's just, it's, I, I'm just blown away by the ingenuity with which they're doing them. So um, here's a couple that are members, actually, of the North Dallas or North Texas uh, chapter of SEA. So there's, is there anyone here from ACH? Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, I, I, I checked out some of our members. ACH, Ch Child and Family Services, I think it's called. Amazing nonprofit, the, uh, the Bellflower Chapel, where they've taken an asset of theirs and turned it into a beautiful place uh, to have a wedding to support the work uh, that they're doing with children and families. Ter terribly, terribly exciting. Um, somebody's here from uh, Catholic Charities of, of Fort Worth. Uh, I've spoken about Warren. And uh, they're kind of a good example that I use in, in a lot of my talks. Uh, Warren is their enterprise that is uh, employing, I believe, immigrant women to make these absolutely beautiful, beautiful scarves um, that have beautiful value in and of their own. They're creating value for the buyer of that scarf while creating value in the life of the person that's, that's creating the scarf. Um, and then there is uh, the uh, Cafe Momentum. Uh, and Cafe Momentum is part of a national movement. Is there anyone here from Cafe Momentum? No. Um, are you part of Catalyst Kitchen, no. uh, the organization? So there's a there's there's a whole bunch of social enterprises in most of the large cities around the around the US that are using a food service and a, and a training program, usually in beautiful restaurants with great chefs, to create employment for people facing barriers. Um, just the ingenuity that goes into Enterprise after enterprise after enterprise like this, and I, I could go through our member list and show you dozens and hundreds of, of equally uh, exciting uh, organizations. There's one in, in uh, Houston called Genesis Works, 
Uh, they also have uh, Genesis Works in Minneapolis and recently in San Francisco. Genesis Works uh, employs high school kids in, in uh, IT departments, outsourced IT departments in major corporations uh, around the U.S. and uh, about 90% of them go out to college. An amazing tech enterprise called Benetech that makes the most sophisticated literacy software uh, in, the, uh, in the world and is actually organized as a hybrid of both a for-profit and a non-profit. Uh, Network for Good, one of our board members who's not here, who processes $135 million a year in donations uh, for the nonprofit sector. This is my, my current uh, most amazing story. This is the cap of Bergen County, New Jersey, who through a partnership with Goldman Sachs has put solar arrays on virtually all, on the roofs of virtually all of the nonprofits in Bergen County, New Jersey. A beautiful business opportunity for Goldman Sachs to get into the solar business. All the nonprofits that have put the solar arrays on their roofs are now getting free energy simply for giving their roof to the project. So a win-win. They think of the energy bill in, in Bergen County, New Jersey, uh, without that solar array. And then you go around the world. This this is one of my, my favorite uh, examples of a, of a developing country project. If I told you that one of the biggest problems in sub-Saharan uh, Africa is uh, people carrying water five to ten miles in a jug on their back and what would happen to the water and what would happen to the carrier of that water to get water to a family. And you only saw that picture of the water wheel. I wouldn't have to tell you anything more about what an amazing enterprise that is. This is the Uber shelter. Um, this is a house that will see, uh, that'll, uh, that'll take care of a family of four uh, in the midst of a disaster. Um, this is how the house is constructed. That's a four by eight pallet that allows that to be shipped immediately into disaster zones. Here's Samosource. Samosource is an amazing nonprofit in San Francisco. They outsource, they take IT projects, they break it down into tiny, tiny little mini projects. They go into uh, developing countries in Asia and put a satellite internet into a community uh, and buy a $50 laptop for many people in the community, and they take these IT projects, break them down into many, many IT projects that they can employ people you know, in, uh, in developing countries to produce. And it's a beautiful business play for the country who outsources it to them, or for the company who outsources it to them, and an opportunity for real skills and real income to be built in these communities. So you can't help but be in my line of work and not just go, wow. I mean, it, it, it just goes on and on and on, the solutions that are being created. And so those all appeal to the creative side of me and the business person side of me. But I think the reason that social enterprise at this point, at this moment in time, and given what I said before about what we've just witnessed in, in Washington, why this field is growing so very, very rapidly and organically, why 60 people turn out in Dallas uh, on a Thursday night uh, for an event like this, is because of the impact and the opportunity it has to create fundamental change in the way things work in a way that works better. Um, so I'm going to tell you about what I think some of those things are and, and some of the reasons that, that social enterprise is growing as a solution. So the first one is obviously social impact. I'll, I'll use my example of where I worked at Rebuild Resources. Uh, we took people that were coming out of the prison system, we employed them, 68% of them got placed in the traditional economy after six months and took them off the welfare rolls, the public assistance rolls, took them out of the citizen cycle and so forth. So I had to figure out how do you tell the story about, about rebuild resources in a way that's going to get people's attention? Because I came at it from sort of a standpoint of, uh, frankly, um, a, a human rights perspective. Give, people need a second chance, right? And I realized that that doesn't always play. It, it, it's not always the best way for the widest swath of society to try to sell the benefits of an organization like that. And as I drilled down on it, I thought, this is about fiscal responsibility. Because we had data from the, state, um, from the state treasurer's office that said that everybody that we successfully took out of that cycle saved the state about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 per year. You don't have to serve too many people for that number to roll up into a really big number. So you could sell something like rebuild resources on the, on the basis of fiscal responsibility. You can sell it on the basis of public safety. The people that we served at Rebuild Resources didn't commit crime when they left Rebuild Resources, or at least 68% of them. 
of Denver. So people like safe streets. That's a social impact from a social enterprise that is universal. Economic development. We were located in a depressed community. We brought jobs into the depressed community, made the community better. Everybody likes economic development. And then, last but not least, if only the reason that you're doing it is social justice, which is really how I got into it in the first place, the opportunity to give people a second chance was a true opportunity for social justice. So all of these social impacts stacked up from rebuild resources, and the cost of providing them went down because of the efficiency of a model in which about 80% of the budget was created by the business rather than through government or through philanthropy. So that's a, that's a story that is powerful and a story that is contagious and a story that will spread on behalf of social enterprise. So another reason that people are falling all over themselves about social enterprise is uh, what I would call a, a, a funding leverage. So at Rebuild, we earn about 80% of the budget, and this is not uncommon for many social enterprises to do something like this. We earn about 80% of the budget uh, through the businesses that we ran, and about 20% of the budget through philanthropy and grants. What that meant to the person who gave us the grants or the philanthropy was that the dollar that they gave us was basically leveraged by about four to one by customers who were making a fair exchange. They gave us four dollars, we gave them a t-shirt that was worth four dollars. That provided 80% of the budget. The other dollar came from philanthropy. It was matched four to one uh, by, by the business side uh, of the house. So folks that are interested in seeing their dollars go further get very, very excited about social enterprise. Social enterprise, I believe, represents a new narrative. Uh, we heard uh, a conversation uh, last fall that it was basically this old narrative that said, you know, 47% of people are lazy and 53% are not. Uh, whether, you, whether you buy the statistics or not, that's a, a fairly common way of looking at, at society and how we take care of problems. The new narrative of social enterprise, where we're using business models to put people that face huge barriers to work, is a, is a model where we don't have to look at anybody as lazy. Um, that's a unifying idea, not a, not a separating idea. And as a result of that, I believe that social enterprise is a concept that now really has the opportunity to, to gather major cross-aisle bipartisan political support. We see that in some of our work in Washington. So um, we've had this dichotomy, um, and I'm, I'm taking no judgment on either side of this dichotomy, but sort of this war between compassionate conservatives and irresponsible liberals. Right? I mean, that's how, uh, uh, that's how it's characterized. What social enterprise does, or uh, I'm sorry, this war between heartless conservatives and irresponsible liberals, that's how each side sees the other. The, the narrative in social enterprise is a world of responsible, compassionate innovators. Who can't get behind that? And then social enterprise attracts partners. Uh, Suzanne referred to UPS, so there's an old paradigm that says, you have on one side of the road the social sector, on the other side of the road the private sector. Social enterprise is the paradigm that brings that into one sector that is working together and working hand in hand for social solutions. Um, and then finally, um, it, it, um, I would say it's contagious. Um, people, the reason that we have a, a chapter structure in SEA is as a national membership organization, we realize we provide certain benefits to the sector, certain benefits to our members, but there is nothing like people getting together in the same room at the same time to talk about what they're doing and trade solutions. So when I come to an event like this, I'm kind of eavesdropping on the conversations that, go on, that are going around, and things are happening. Um, Tony Mendez is talking to Troy Bowles uh, about working together on the academic side of things. That doesn't happen through a membership organization that's not down. It happens through chapters. It happens through people getting together, talking to each other, trading notes, and figuring out what they can do together. So then the question is, to me, and what the work of SEA at this point is, is now what? So we've established that social enterprises are cool. We've established that they have all these sort of transcendental, unifying social impacts that make them popular, that make them the opportunity to fundamentally change how we produce results in this country. 
So what has to happen now? Well, in, in our opinion, in Social Enterprise uh, Alliance, and the reason that we do the work that we do, it's really for three things. It's, it's first of all, social enterprises need to get better at what they're doing. Um, so a lot of our work is around knowledge and best practices and teaching. They need to get better so that they can get bigger. And they need to get bigger so that they can do more. That's the pretty simple analysis of why, uh, why Social Enterprise Alliance is here and uh, why we hope that you'll all become part of Social Enterprise Alliance. And so with that, a little bit about Social Enterprise Alliance, just a few quick words about us. Um, they're, they're after all the reason that I, that I was able to come here and talk to you tonight. Uh, we are the um, membership organization for social enterprise in the United States um, for the diverse and rapidly growing uh, social enterprise sector. Um, our mission is defined as producing massive social value through successful social enterprises. We're real clear on this. SEA itself has never produced a social impact on its own. What it has done has, has been to support the work of the Catholic Charities in Fort Worth and Cafe Momentum um, and the chapel at ACH so that they could do their work better and create more social impact. So our mission is to create, we certainly measure it in terms of, of, social, of that social impact, but our mission is accomplished through the work of you all. Uh, we, we do this through sort of four main strategies. One is knowledge and um, best practices and research products. Uh, secondly is uh, building social enterprise communities and networks, um, telling the stories and aggregating the impact uh, of social enterprise uh, is very, very important because that's part of making the case for the field. And then finally, try to create a supportive public policy environment for social enterprise. Uh, we've been around for about 14 years. Uh, we've got, as I said earlier, over about 1,000 members. We're organized into 13 chapters in 11 states. There are several more that are on the drawing board right now and uh, that we hope to be introducing uh, very soon. Uh, and we've got this wide tent of investors, partners, uh, certainly at the core of social enterprise practitioners, academics, researchers, anybody who's playing in social enterprise we're trying to make part of our community. As a member, we try to create value in three ways for our members. One of them is sort of direct value. So what's in it for the member that helps the member do their business uh, better is, is uh, very important. Uh, secondly, collective value. What are we doing to try to build the field as a whole, for instance, through public policy work? And then finally, through fostering local value uh, through uh, chapters like, uh, like we have here. Um, I won't, this is not a sales pitch for SEA. I will tell you we have a variety of different kinds of memberships from individual to organizational memberships. At different levels of memberships, we have all sorts of different benefits for our members um, that sort of are, are on a scale based on the size of the organization and the dues and so forth. Uh, some of those benefits include our newsletters, our free monthly <coughs> webinar series for our, for our members. Uh, one that we're very excited about and I think we'll be investing a lot over the next year in is our Knowledge Center. It's called Kessie Tool Belt, which has got 2,000 fantastic resources on social enterprise that you can go in and browse. Uh, our members get a variety of subscriptions through us, including the Stanford Social Innovation Review. They become a part of the grant station organization, which is a great way to search for grants. A lot of opportunities for marketing and visibility and promotion of your social enterprise through SEA. Uh, a lot of emphasis on networking and engagement opportunities like this one. Uh, and our, our larger members are able to receive some co custom uh, coaching and consultation from us. Um, we are a membership organization, so our members have a vote in what we do, and we frequently survey our members to find out how they like what we're doing. Uh, and then our chapters around the country are a huge benefit uh, to our members. Interestingly enough, uh, about 35% of our members are located in markets where we don't have chapters. Um, and so it sort of proves the direct and collective value part of SEA in markets where we're not offering local value. Uh, one opportunity that I'm really, really excited about is our national summit. Um, our registration is going to be opening on Monday for our national summit. If you go to our website on Monday, I believe you'll be able to register. That's our national conference. That's really how SEA got started uh, 12 or 13 years ago was um, a conference that actually Jared O'Shea uh, organized. Uh, Jared was from Minneapolis at the time, by the way. I knew him. He was the first guy that ever uttered the word social enterprise to me. 
And I, didn't, I was doing one, and I didn't know that that's what it was. Uh, he invited me to this conference. I said, I'm too busy running my business to come to your conference. And, um, but that was the first conference in Boulder, Colorado in 1998-99, something like that. And now it's all come full circle, and I have the opportunity to, to serve SEA as a CEO. So that's, that's very odd. But uh, the summit is a three-day event. Uh, it uh, attracts usually six to 800 folks. Um, top level keynote speakers, uh, all sorts of breakout sessions with anything from technical information to inspirational uh, sessions. Uh, a lot of storytelling will be done at our summit this year. Um, it is and has been historically the event for social enterprise uh, in North America. And this year we're doing it in Minneapolis where our office is now located. So we're pulling out all the stops because we're right there in town to make it, make it happen. So I encourage you all to come and we'd love to. Uh, see you in uh, in Minneapolis, and while Minneapolis on January 3rd is not nearly as nice as Dallas on January 3rd, um, I'm, I'm going to say that Minneapolis on May 19th through 22nd holds a candle to any place in the world. That's about the best time you can come to uh, Minneapolis, which is a very hot social enterprise city. So please come to Minneapolis in May for our, for our uh, social enterprise uh, summit. Um, the, um, I was asked to speak a little bit about what SEA will look like in the future. Now, this is really interesting because as Suzanne said, we've got three or four board members in the room uh, tonight, and we have a board meeting tomorrow, and uh, at the board meeting tomorrow, I'm supposed to present the plan for the strategic plan for SEA for next year and for the foreseeable future. So. Um, it's a little bit, uh, you know, how do I quite have this conversation to tell you what I think SEA is going to look like in the future um, without having had the benefit of actually presenting it to my board. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so my, my strategy, and actually the reason I want them all to come tonight is that when I, when I talk to you a little bit about what SEA might look like about in the future, I want to I hear a few amens on that. <laughs> I want the board to know that the, the troops out here that are really doing the work and not sitting in the ivory tower of the board. <laughs> I say that in chess, my board, my board is very high work, hard working, but I, I want everyone to kind of get the notion that, that there might be some support for this. So I would say one of the most fundamental things that we're thinking about at SEA is of all the myriad things that we could be doing, what is the most important thing that has to be done to take this amazing idea of this social enterprise and turn it into something that is truly operating at scale to transform things. And that, in our opinion, uh, this is not new to the board, is really focusing on uh, making the case for social enterprise. How do we tell a funder, if you fund social enterprise, your dollar goes further? How do we tell a public policy official that if you create support of public policy that supports social enterprise, taxpayer dollars go further and the problems that you're trying to grapple with as a, as a policymaker get easier to grapple with. How do we tell a corporation that if you do business with a social enterprise, you're going to get products and services that are every bit as good as the competition from the standpoint of quality, service, and value, and are creating a social impact? So uh, I think that you can expect a lot of our work around SEA is going to be around making the case for the field. Um, that requires sort of a change in mentality of an organization. And this is really pretty exciting. Um, it, it sort of changes the mentality of the organization from we're a membership organization because people who belong to membership organizations have witnessed membership organizations doing things that make sure that the membership organization stays alive and survives and sometimes lose focuses on why they're doing it. And so I think that, that you can probably expect to see from SEA a shift of our thinking from membership organization to movement building. Right? How do we create a movement around social enterprise? Social enterprise has been kind of creeping along for the last, I mean, actually 150 years in the U.S. since the first goodwill was started in the late 1800s. But even after Jerry started doing the summits uh, in, in the late 90s, it's been sort of this well-kept secret um, that no longer can afford to be well-kept because the problems are too great and the traditional solutions just haven't worked well enough. So. We're really now thinking in terms of a movement about social enterprise. And what do movements do to create change? 
And one of the things that movements do to create change is they amass large portions of the population behind them. So another thing that you can probably, if you see it happen in the next year, you'll say, well, that's what he was talking about the night before the board meeting, and he must have bought off on it, <laughs> is, is really sort of a notion around trying to take 1,000 members, and how do you take 1,000 members and turn that into 10,000 members and 100,000 members? Um, so much more of a sort of a wide tent um, focus, which will have a lot of impacts on how we price membership and how we invite people into our community and, um, and those types of things. And then the final thing that I, that I uh, think is probably a pretty safe bet that you'll be hearing from us um, by the way, have you, I haven't heard any amens on this. Amen. 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 So, okay. <laughs> the reason the board all sat in the back was so that they could see all your heads nodding. Uh, uh, the, the final thing that I think you can expect to see from us is a lot more focus on uh, building partnerships. Um, because, frankly, this field, you know, 15 years ago, you could probably keep track of everybody who was kind of doing everything cool. When Jared had the first, uh, the first event, he and a couple of buddies said, who are the 30 or 40 people that are doing something? And that's who they invited uh, to the event. And now, you I mean, if you Google social enterprise, hopefully we still come up pretty high on Google. I know that we do. But in every corner of every city, uh, big or small, of every country, there are new projects that are emerging from a social enterprise standpoint. And to create a movement, those all have to be healthy, and those all have to be vibrant, and those all have to be connected. And so we will see part of our work for making the case for the field and growing the field will be to try to be sort of the connecting point, the collaborator that is able to quickly and facilely bring a lot of those organizations together. Um, and so those are some of the things that, you know, those are my aspirations for SEA. Um, I, I left a enterprise that I really, really love uh, being part of. Um, I, I mentioned that, S, that Rebuild Resources was an organization that worked with recovering addicts and alcoholics. That happens to describe me. And so I left an organization where I was working with my brethren every day to try to create results for them and for the community in order to take the reins of Social Enterprise Alliance where I don't get to, to work with hands-on with, with the people that we work with every day, but I get the opportunity to work with beautiful, stunning people like you that are doing amazing things. Uh, in the community, and um, I didn't. I didn't join SEA to do that on a small scale. I, I, I want SEA to be in a position to really create that that new kind of economy that works for everyone. That's not for profit, not non profit, not non governmental organization, but a for purpose economy. And that's uh, that's what we're here for. Real quick, if you join SEA, we have a little special for folks who came here tonight. We're running this through. I believe next Friday, the 11th, uh, if you sign up and you use that promo code NORTHTX13, uh, you can get your first two months free of an SEA membership. Uh, I get a little ding on my computer every time somebody signs up, so you know, it's tough me the state that it came from, so I'm going to be looking for a lot of things with TX next to it uh, over the next uh, seven or eight days. Um, we have some literature on the back counter that also has pictures of our staff. But here's the folks in our office that would be happy to help you if you call in. There's myself, Josh LeBeau, who works with um, member benefits, uh, Madeline Hart Anderson, who's our customer service person, and Madeline Graham, who works with our chapter. Uh, please join me in throwing a bouquet of love to create a better economy. Thanks. We have time for questions, I think. You, you had your hand up first, yeah. by, by a hair. Yeah, I'm Barbara Clark Lindsay with Bell Power Chapel and Gardens. Oh. Um, I had a question as an SEA member. Um, as part of that creating a movement and creating value, how do you see SEA National um, creating, I didn't hear any verbiage around professional development or creating career paths in social enterprise that in other movements like fundraising within the nonprofit sector they created these professional development opportunities not just around creating um, helping the enterprises be successful but right. helping create careers in social enterprise and I don't I've never hear much about that anymore. yeah that's a really good question so um, two things I'd say on that uh, one is uh, at our summit when you go to our summit site 
uh, we basically, the way we're organizing the summit is around this concept of the building blocks of social enterprise. And there are six or seven building blocks. Uh, the flow of capital to social enterprise, support of public policy, knowledge and best practices, uh, efficient marketplaces. One of those building blocks is the, uh, the building block of bringing the best talent to the field. And so uh, we, we see that as part of making the case is making the case to students to go into the field, making the case to academics to, uh, to uh, become activated in the field. At our summit, we're going to have an entire track on um, talent attraction. So it's both on the academic side of preparing people, but then also on the pulled side of bringing people into organizations. So we, we definitely see that as one of the, the building blocks and are committed to that. Uh, and you'll see some programming at the summit on that. The other thing I would say would be uh, what I said earlier about partnerships comes really into play. So I've gotten to know this guy named Tony Mendes, who, who Suzanne introduced me to at the University of North Texas. And Tony academically is working on a program to do a, basically an a academic certification around social enterprise. And if he's successful, and having talked to him on the phone <coughs> tonight, night, I have no doubt that he will, um, that will be a way to sort of organically and with a huge exponential multiplier effect um, create more trained people to come into the field. So SEA doesn't need to do that work. SEA needs to know that Tony's doing that work. Get Tony to come to our conferences. Go to Tony's conferences. When he has something that, that is you know, a linkable thing, um, link that onto our website and promote it as, as one good example of one, one organization who's doing something really effective and potentially impactful for the field that we become the partner and the collaborator with rather than trying to have to think that we do it all ourselves. What about this new um, business designation I've been hearing of? You know, the S and C corporations, what do you call them, the E Corp, where so you, you know, since corporations are legally required to maximize, share, maximize shareholder value, that the core company that says that one of your responsibilities is to the community, you know, so somehow, and you're talking about this um, degree and stuff. You know, meshing with business rather than, you know, if you're in a university, social work is one side of campus and business, yep. you know, it's a completely different image in there. So, what's that? Yeah, did everyone hear the question? Um, Can you restate that a little bit? Well, I mean, I think generally the question was about some of the new corporate forums that are coming up, um, that are coming available for, for organizations to work with uh, that are something different than a traditional um, for profit corporation, something different than a 501c3. There's, um, so, um, I mean, we don't have a, uh, how do I say this? SEA doesn't have a position on those other than. Uh, in general, those help the field, but we're not, again, we're not the ones who are out there promoting those forms so much as trying to educate our members about them. There's two main ones that are happening today. One of them is called the L3C, um, and there's, I think, 13 or 14 states that have an L3C form, and uh, the other one is called the Benefit Corporation, and I think that there's 11 or 12 states that have a Benefit Corporation. And, and basically, those, those are really snazzy opportunities for a corporation to be formed that does not have a fiduciary responsibility to say that shareholders come absolutely first above all others. So in, in, in corporations, um, corporations are forced to make decisions that primarily benefit stakeholders because that's the responsibility by charter of a corporation. And what these new forums do is allow a corporation to say, that's not the only, uh, that's not the only uh, mission that we answer to, so that they're off the hook if they try to do things that are, that are uh, focused from a purpose standpoint um, on purpose rather than um, shareholder. So um, they're, they're, the growth of those is a great example of why this field is so exciting, because with those fundamental changes, it's going to unleash the capacity of business to start working more focused on uh, social uh, social issues. So, um, personal opinion is they're a good thing. Um, we're we're not in the business ourselves of promoting them because there's so many people that are in, at state and local levels that are our part of doing that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name's uh, David Delos, and. Uh, of course, I spent the last eight years working for a heartless uh, conservative. But uh, needless to say, um, 
I've been inspired to uh, get into a social uh, enterprise, and I wanted to see, I don't know if you have a specific answer for this, but when you're getting ready to launch an organization, I just want to know is what is the success rate for a social enterprise organization, and also how long does it typically take um, you know, to see success in a social organization? Is it 10 years, 15 years, one year? Yeah. No particular study on that. Uh, my rule of thumb on it uh, would be, so start with, I mean, what's really a social enterprise? You get rid of all my fancy slides. A social enterprise is a business whose primary purpose is the common good. I mean, that's the, the, the quickest way that I can think of to describe a social enterprise. And if you accept that definition just for a moment, then the answer to your question would be the same as any business. So, um, you know, what's the statistic? Three out of four businesses go under in the first year or in the first three years or something like that. I think that you can say that that statistic probably applies to social enterprises as well. What's interesting is that the reasons that social, that, that three out of four businesses go out of business in three or four years, if that's the number, don't quote me on that. You know, there's this long list of reasons that range from lack of capital to bad management to bad marketing to cash flow to, you know, product quality issues, customer service issues. You got this long list of things that can go wrong. What do you know? Social enterprises, why do they go out of business? The same, the same list of things. At the Bellwether Chapel, can you, can you afford to have a dirty altar when somebody goes in there to get married? Uh, you have to be as good as any other chapel that they have to go into. Um, if you don't market your organization, you're not going to succeed. You see, so all the same reasons that 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 flummox a for a regular business will flummox a social enterprise. On top of that, there's a few things that a social enterprise can do to screw things up that a for-profit business necessarily doesn't um, have the opportunity to do. Uh, a lot of that will often start with a board who doesn't understand the business versus a non-profit mentality. Uh, it'll often start with a, um, a unrealistic, how do I say this, an unrealistic commitment to mission over business to say, you know, we can't make this hard decision about an employee because of our mission. Failing to realize that not making that hard decision about the employee will actually destroy the mission because they'll go out of business. So you have a list of reasons that a social enterprise will also fail that our traditional business doesn't face. But you also have a list of advantages that the social enterprise has, some, some arrows in its quiver that are traditional for-profit business um, or a not-for-purpose business. See, I'm using the same, I'm making the same mistake on language that I was just missing on my charts. Um, uh, there's, there's advantages that, that come to a social enterprise. I think that there's great advantages in the talent that the social enterprise can attract in this day and age. There's some real tangible advantages in a um, marketing perspective that a social enterprise uh, can capitalize on and so forth. So, so the trick is, like, avoid all the, all the traps that not-for-purpose businesses stumble on. Um, avoid the social enterprise traps and then capitalize on these points of leverage that are available to a social enterprise that will help the social enterprise succeed. And if all those things happen, I think the statistics on social enterprise would be about the same. We have time for one more question. Then, Kevin, might you address a question? One of the things we're trying to do as a chapter is help identify social enterprises that are already running. Some of you already mentioned you were running social enterprises. Think of it that way. We've got a lot of people who are running social enterprises. We're trying to identify them. Anything any of the chapters have done that might be creative ways to help reach out to people? Um, yeah. Uh, well, obviously, they, they all do, the successful chapters all do a lot of events. Um, people like to get together. Um, in this day of social media, what chapters do better is I think there's still a crying demand for it. I, I read about a website where it's a website that gets people to go and have dinner with each other. Because <laughs> the, it's a social media website that rates people about how good they are to go have dinner because people want to have interaction. 
Um, go, go figures. Um, so people people want to get together, and I encourage chapters to do a steady stream of events. Do them all over town. Do them on a combination of things that might be educational, but tours of social enterprises uh, are huge. Um, one common denominator that three or four of our chapters have done, uh, I think quite successfully, is they've done events that are some version of either a business plan competition or a pitch night um, or a something that has sort of a crowdfunding focus to uh, uh, presenting ideas and rating ideas and finding collaborators. Because what, what chapters do is not just to get together and, and drink wine, although you and Jack are going to find a job at Corning tonight, but it's it's actually to, to do things that have some, some legs beyond the social part um, and some connectivity that actually sort of creates a reason for the people who come there to the next day or that evening to say, you know, I have to follow up with that person. Um, I want to be in community with that person. And if enough of that happens, then, then the demand for the chapter really grows. So. Let's hear it for Kevin Lynch.